And he looked out and he said, if you guys start crying, I'm, I'm going to have to, I'll have to stop here because I'm going to start crying. But this morning, I feel like, I feel like I want to cry for another reason. Marcia was sharing with, with us uh, yesterday and that within the last couple of months, Milton, who we had been praying for for years, came to know Christ as his Savior before he went to be with the Lord. Another individual we've been praying for for a long time is Xavier, who was here this morning. <laughs> and Marcia said with just the last couple of weeks, he's come to know Christ as well. And I want to say this. We plant seeds and we water and we plant and we water and we pray and we wait and we speak and we do all these things and we have to wait sometimes, don't we? Sometimes for years. But the Spirit is moving and the Spirit is working and He has His hand in it and we, have, we are left with one very important ingredient and that is faith, to trust in Him. That what He says in His Word he is capable of doing and he will do. This morning our passage, is a, as I just shared it with Kyle, what it was here in, in Romans chapter 1. Kyle mentioned to me, he said, Dave, that's the first passage I ever preached on. That's the first passage I had to prepare. And it is found here. Let's start in, in verse 13 as it's on the screen, right? It says this, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you, but I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just like we talked about. Just as I was, um, just as I have seen among other Gentiles. And there he's speaking, remember he was in Ephesus as he had a couple of years there and he wrote the book of 1st and 2nd Corinthians and then he also wrote the book of Romans and he started here by saying what we talked about last week in chapter 15 of Romans, how he wanted to see them. It says here in verse 14, it says, for I have a great, great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world as well, to the educated and uneducated alike. Not only do I have a great obligation, a sense of obligation, but verse 15 says, so I am eager to come to you in Rome also to preach the good news. Now this morning, this particular passage of the next two verses I'm going to read, and that's the, that's the section of scripture for this morning, uh, is this is in the New Living Translation. So as you listen to it, it may be different from the way that you memorized it. This is a very key uh, part of scripture, like I was saying to to Kyle this morning, it is probably one of the top five passages in the entire Bible. And it says in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Verse 17 says, this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by this one word, faith. As the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. And there, I, I love the passage. I just, I'm sorry, I've memorized this one too, too long. In Habakkuk 2.4, and then in other translations, it's, maybe you know it as this, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. Here as we, we, we think about this passage, one of the things I was thinking about this week is the book that we've been reading and what changes it's made in my own personal life um, this summer. And one of the things several weeks ago we went over was um, uh, the lies the enemy tells us and when he sits at our seat. I, I can't, and just as a testimony, I won't be able to say to our people, but, but now I will tell you that this book, as I read through the five lies that it brings out that Satan likes to tell us, to me, it just opened up more lies that I've been hearing, buying into, and listening to for years. These lies are this. Listen to it. These are the first five that Louis Giglio wrote down. And one of the things we said several weeks ago is let's start adding to this list the lies that you've been hearing. You start writing it down because when you identify that lie, you know how to categorize it. And you know where to put it, right? File 13. It says here, 
the lie of comparison. The grass is greener. You can go back. Let's go back to that old life that we had. No, that's a lie. It's a lie from the evil one. He tries to pull up to our table, doesn't he, and share this truth in his mind, but it's a lie. The second one is this, the lie that you're doomed. You know, as I listen to that, the lie that you're doomed, I hear it in so many different forms. <laughs> and this week I was listening to it, I was like, oh, no, 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 wait a second. I know, that, I know what that sounds like. Oh, that's a variation off of you're doomed. I'm not going to accept that lie. That is not true. Number three, the lie of worthlessness. You're worthless. God can't do anything with you. It's a lie. And don't you see it in all the different forms that he comes at you with? Number, number four says this, the lie of me against the world. I'm the only one. I'm all alone. <laughs> There's nobody who can, who can understand my situation. There's nobody who can help me. I'm by myself. Satan loves to isolate us. And then the last one was this. And this is a lot like the being doomed is this, the life, or excuse me, the lie that, that there's no way out. He tells us that a lot in there. There's no way out of this situation. This is unique from every other situation, and there is no way out. It is a lie. And several weeks ago, we added to that list number six, and here it is. The lie that you can enjoy this sin just this once. Just this once you can enjoy it. Look, hey, as soon as, you know, you start feeling a little bit guilty, just ask for forgiveness. It'll, it'll pay, you know, it, it'll be done and just enjoy it this one time. No, that's a lie from the devil. Can I give you another lie this morning? And this one I want you to think about. Here's a lie from the enemy. You are ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Have you heard that lie? You are ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I hear this all the time. As soon as I went to this passage and I saw it, I started studying and I came to the conclusion, I've been hearing this lie for years. Oh my goodness, you should have. You had an opportunity to share the gospel and you didn't. You are officially ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I've heard that lie over and over. One of the reasons I believe that the Lord led Paul to write this verse was for me. God loves me so much. He wrote the Bible for me. Listen to what it says here. And you listen to what I've been quoting all week. Listen to it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Say it over and over this week. Every time you hear the lie that you are ashamed because of something you didn't do, the sin of, what is it? There's a sin of commission. This is a sin of omission. Just say right back to the evil one, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Think about it. How many times do you cry out during a week to the Lord for salvation? How many times, how many situations do you say, Jesus, I'm hearing that voice that says, I'm not going to get out of this one. You have to help me. Please save me. You know what that is? That is you resting in the gospel of Christ that he will deliver. That is an active participation in the gospel. And you can say it boldly and confidently. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. Listen, maybe you don't know how to put it in words. Maybe you don't know how to explain it. You can bring someone here to church and we'll do the heavy lifting for you. We will stand up in front and say, Christ is the only way. You can turn to him. There's still time. He is the answer. We will do it for you. But listen, don't listen to the lie that you are ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You are not ashamed. If you trusted Christ as Savior, you're participating in that thing called faith where you cry out to him. One of the verses that I've been holding to, I was just sharing with one of my closest friends. I've just, and this is a, this is a commentary on the verse, but this is the way I've interpreted it. And this is what he wants me to say is this, Lord, deliver me. I take refuge in you. Lord, deliver me. That's calling on his salvation, isn't it? Lord, deliver me. I take refuge in you. And from that, we can extrapolate this. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. And forgive me, the translation this morning doesn't read like that, but I can't help it because I've memorized it over and over in the older translation. 
For I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. I love the way the New Living Translation puts it. It goes on in 17. 17, you ever do this? You ever memorize a verse or a passage? And then you think to yourself, I have no clue what that means. And I've said it 50 times. This is one of those passages. I read it over and over. It reads like this. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. What does that mean? But I memorized it. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. I have no clue. Listen to the way it reads in the New Living Translation. The good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. Isn't that good? The good news, the gospel, it is good news, the gospel that we share. We're going to talk about it here in just a second. It tells us and how God makes us right in his sight. And this is accomplished from start to finish by faith. By faith, by faith, by faith. We're going to talk about that. But first what I want to say is this. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to save. And the first area is this, and simply sin. One of the things, uh, this is the next thing that I got from Louis Giglio's book that I shared yesterday in the funeral service. It is so powerful this week. The way, I've never read it placed this way before. Louis talked about this thing in chapter 8 about guilt and how guilt can be positive in our life. And uh, it needs to be used in, in, in a positive way in which when we are guilty, what do we do? We first John 1, 9. We confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we acknowledge our guilt. We say this, I, like I said, I shared it yesterday. We say, Lord, I am guilty of this sin. The next thing that should happen in the process is we should feel remorse. Guilt, remorse. And then you know what we do in our human nature? We take guilt and we attach it to this thing that is our identity. Isn't this crazy? When we attach guilt to our identity, you know what we say? We say, I am bad. Did you notice that? I do certain things, but shame, shame says this, I am evil, I am bad, I am dirty. It identifies with the iniquity. It identifies with the guilt. But that's when we start having this conception of ourselves. I think that is a necessary component to moving an individual to have this thing called salvation in their life. Hey, listen, we're going to practice salvation constantly as believers. Lord, save me from this, save me from this, save me from that. Lord, this relationship... Lord, this situation, it seems impossible. Lord, save me. But the thing that draws us into a relationship with God the Father is this thing called acknowledging our sin. I own my guilt. That's the first step. And then Christ says what? In your shame, let me remove your guilt. Let me wipe the slate clean. We sang about it this morning. And when I wipe the slate clean, Jesus says, there is no longer any need for shame because you cannot identify yourself with that iniquity. What iniquity? As far as the east is from the west, so far have I placed that sin and that iniquity from you. When we turn to Christ and apply the blood of Jesus Christ to our life and to our sin, God says you are in right fellowship with me. Listen, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to save us from sin, first and foremost. That's what he came to do. You know, there's a lot of gospels out there in this world, and we've had some good ones. One of the first gospels that I heard came from President Obama, and it was sweet music to my ears. Obama spoke, and one of the things, one of his platforms was this. He said these words. He says, I'm going to take college football. And I'm going to make them, make them have a playoff. Woo, that was the gospel to Dave right there. <laughs> College football is going to have a playoff? Oh my goodness, that's what I've been wanting for years. Yes. You know, there's so many different gospels. I, I got a new car, the gospel of my new car. Well, it's used. It's the best I can do, you know. It's paid off, praise God, from the equity from our home that we sold. But hey, it's the gospel of my new car. There's so many gospels out there. But aren't they empty and without power in your life? I don't know. If they move to 12 teams in the playoff, I I think that one might have a little more power. 
you know, one guy said 64 teams, right? <clears throat> There's so many different things that bring about good news that we want to share, but nothing compares to the way that God came and says, your greatest need, your greatest problem, first and foremost, is that I take your sin. Nothing can take our sin away. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It is the gospel. It is the true good news. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. In what area first? To our sin? To our sin. The second area is this. When Christ came, it was not just for our sin to give us power and salvation over our sin, but it was to give us power and salvation over the devil himself. Now, I'm a little reserved in the sense that I don't like talking about the devil. You know, I feel like the devil gets his due enough. He gets enough publicity, you know, but we do have to talk about him because the reality is for humanity, when the devil shows up and he begins to move and act, there is very little humans can do. His power is far superior to human power. That's why the fascination is there. You know, we think we're above all demon activity in America. Uh, we act like we are, but the reality is Hollywood is telling us, oh no, we can make money off of this. There's a fascination with the devil. We're drawn to those things. Why? Because right at the core of our humanity, it scares us to death when we deal with the devil and the power of Satan. All throughout all generations, they've tried to do things to counteract the devil's power. They will have, um, oh... All different types of talismans, right? They'll build a cauldron and they'll put all kind of creepy things in it. They will say, go and do this or take this or do that. Uh, so many different things. They've, they, what? We have to have holy smoke and water and we have to have a, a cross and all these different things in order to get rid of the power of the devil. When Christ came, it was the gospel to us to remove the power of Satan from our lives. Listen, listen to what it says here in Mark chapter 1, in verse 21, early on in Jesus' ministry. It says, Then he went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. This was the Lord's pattern, therefore that's why we saw Paul do it all throughout the book of Acts. In verse 22 it says, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as having authority and not as a scribe. Now there was a man there in the synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out. Isn't that something? You go to church on Sunday morning, you arrive there and you expect to have fellowship with people and there is a man in church who has a demon in him. And listen to what the demon was doing. He was crying out and he said this, verse 24, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know that you are the Holy One of God. Look at verse 25. Verse 25 is monumental. Jesus rebuked him and said, Be quiet. Come out of him. Listen to what happened. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, all of Satan's parlor tricks, he came out of him. Then they that were there in the synagogue were amazed. So they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even unclean spirits and they obey him. When Christ came, it was the gospel. It was the good news unto salvation to those who believe for our sin. But not only that. For the devil as well too, to show that he has power over all of his creation. Christ came to save us. Save us, number one, from sin and save us, number two, from the devil. The last piece here that he saved us from is from death itself. All of the major issues and problems that we have in this life, Christ came to truly apply his blood to, to give us the thing called salvation. In Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it says this. Oh, that's 10. I'll find it. There we go. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after that, the judgment. Death is pretty scary too. I mean, we've listed some things that are pretty scary. 
demon activity, but death itself, that's a big one. When death comes, you can't negotiate with death. You can't compromise with death. You cannot go to death and say, hold on a second. I have Facebook stock from its inception. I have so much money. Give me a few more years, please. We cannot make compromise with death. We cannot negotiate. Death has unbelievable unilateral power in the life of humanity. Death is a certainty along with taxes, right? And never was that more apparent than yesterday at the funeral. There's nothing. You, listen, we cannot collectively come together and by our good thoughts and by our good hopes surround someone and cause them not to die. It's impossible. When Christ came, he came with promise. He came with salvation. And you know what? I just got to say this again. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation for sin, for the devil, and for death itself. One of the verses, I think it was Marcia yesterday, that she read, is found in, or maybe it was Xavier. No, Xavier, you read 1 Thessalonians, I believe. Marcia read uh, John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. How many of you know that? How many of you probably know that and could quote it? You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. There are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It is a promise of Christ's victory over death itself. When he came, he came with salvation for our greatest needs. For our greatest needs. I am... Um, I was thinking about this passage and, and verse 17 was very needful. Listen to verse 17. It says this. For this good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Here what's being described is simply a thing called sanctification. We come to know Christ as Savior, and then how are we supposed to live our life? We're not going to be perfect as human beings. We're going to have shortcomings. We're going to have failures. But God's designed for us that through this thing called grace and faith, that we experience sanctification. And sanctification is God taking us and making us usable. But more than that, it here says it is our life. It is the way that we're going to live. Now, it is accomplished through this thing from beginning to end, which is called faith. Now think about the problems and the situations that you face on a, you know, daily, that you go through. Having kids, you've, you've, you know, you've got so many different prayer requests right there that you start with. And it's so odd to me that whenever I get faced with a certain problem or situation, it's almost as though I've totally forgot about all the ways in which God has saved me previous to that. And this situation, I go right back to what the enemy says. It's impossible. It's, you're doomed. There's no way out. And it seems like it takes me 24 hours. And I've, I've tried to figure it out. I phoned a friend. I've Googled it, right? I'm looking it up. I'm, I know, I, I know we, there's something we can do to take care of this. And then all of a sudden it dawns on me. Oh, I know Jesus. There's this thing called the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation to those who believe for this situation right here. It is the good news that we have. And then I go and I pray and I come to a place where he gives me peace and then one by one he starts to take care of the issue and the problem. And I come to a place of, whew, oh, I got that off my back. I feel so good. 24 hours later, boom, another bomb drops. What about this situation? I don't know what I'm going to do. And I phone a friend. And I Google the question and the problem and the situation. And then it dawns on me. There is a Savior, and I can actually pray to the Savior of the universe 
and he can hear my prayer and he can deliver me. You know what I just described to you right there? It's called faith to faith. And you know what God calls this? God calls this righteousness. Abraham believed God. He trusted in God. And it was, a, it was accounted unto him as righteousness. When we purpose in our heart to live by faith and cry out to him as Savior, what we find is God says, I account that to your life as righteousness. When we stand before God, one of the verses yesterday in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right at the end in verse 10, says this, we, speaking of believers, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that we might give an account and receive reward or lack of reward depending on the good and the bad that we have done. Oh my goodness. When I look at that verse on its onset, I'm thinking to myself, I've done so much bad. I've doubted him. I've been ashamed of him. And then I realize what he is talking about there is he's talking about the good that will go on that is accounted unto me is what I have done through faith and trusting in him. There's nothing else. There's nothing else we can bring to God. And you know what faith is? As if we start to treat it as a work. Faith is given to us by grace from God plus nothing completely from him. And he said, this is how I have designed you to live. I've designed you to live by faith. God, why are you putting this problem in my situation? Because I've designed you to live by faith and trusting in me. Dave, do you trust in me? Yes, I do. I'm going to count it to you as righteousness. And herein, it's not just salvation from things, but it's salvation unto. Listen to the verse again. God says this, he tells us how he makes us right in his sight and this is accomplished by faith from start to finish because the righteous will live by faith. Two verses this week. Two verses that you got to live by. Two verses that you have to quote. The first one is this. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Say it over and over again when you doubt. No, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to those who believe. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Here it is again, another problem, another situation. No, the righteous, the just will live by faith. I choose right now to live by faith. Oh, but that doubt starts to creep in. No, I will live by faith. Oh, isn't it so nice to say those words and the reality is he's always there waiting for you to trust in him. To come to that place where you say, Lord, I believe. It takes a process though, doesn't it? So often times, we, the knuckleheads that we are, have to learn it over and over and over. The just will live by faith. Don't let shame sneak into your life. Don't take that guilt in your life and begin to attach it to your identity. Christ came and through his blood, he says, no, I put an end to shame and guilt. No longer belongs in your thought process. It no longer has any business being in the things that you go over throughout the day. Turn to him and quote this. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. I choose to live by faith. From faith to faith. Over and over again. Let's stand together this morning. gospel has the ability to take a person who is addicted and make them free. It has the ability to take a selfish person and make them selfless. The gospel has the ability to take a fearful person and make them brave. A weak person and make them strong. But I think most importantly for me, it has the ability to take a faithless person and cause them to believe and to trust and to rely on him. Oh, truly the gospel is a miracle of God. 
to see a life transformed. Folks, you don't understand what it's like. It seems like as a pastor, <laughs> I don't know, sometimes TJ, I envy you. TJ, he does have a mon monumental list of things he has to get done before Plato starts. And he's working part-time. And he's got all this stuff to get all these rooms ready for these people. But I tell you this, I went into Jill's room and all, the, all that stuff is cleared out. All that wood is cleared out. And from what I can see, basically, the carpet's ready to go in. How did that feel? How did that feel? I, because as a pastor, it seems like you never accomplish anything. Lives are never completely, totally changed. You know what I'm saying? You see the process. You take person from point A to point B, but then it's, oh, it's one step forward, two steps back. Oh, oh another step forward. Oh, no, half a step back. And the job is never done, but to see a job completed and to see somebody's life changed and to know that they went out into, into eternity trusting in the Lord Jesus. Oh, we have no greater joy than to know that our children walk in truth. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that it just is so much more worth it. Lord, when we wait and we see you do it the way you have planned. Lord, I want to personally ask for forgiveness for my impatience in people's lives. My anger towards you because you're not doing what I want you to do when I want you to do it. Lord, thank you for not listening to me. Thank you, Lord, for having a better plan and a better purpose beyond me. Father, we praise you and we acknowledge right now that you are doing a work that will last throughout eternity. Father, as I look at your children today and Lord, what they go through on a daily basis, so oftentimes you know, you know personally, Lord, that I say often to you that you are so merciful to me because it seems like your people have it so much harder. Father, fill them with your grace. Fill them with your strength. Lord, don't let them take a long period of time like I do before they fall into that category of faith and trusting in you. Lord, bless them this week from faith to faith. Let them know, Lord, that the just shall live by faith. Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.